Glory to you, Lord. We thank you for the privilege to be here, the privilege, Lord, to worship you and to praise you and give honor to you, Lord. Seek your direction today as we enter into this service. Give us the wisdom to follow the Holy Spirit. Let it be a God-led service, not a man-led service. And Lord, I pray that when we leave here today, that we would leave with your joy in our heart, rejoicing. I pray that you'll be pleased, Lord, with the things that take place here today, and you will be worshiped. You will be thanked. You will be praised. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. It's a good day. It's a day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. And I do pray that when we leave here today that we'll leave here rejoicing because that's the way we should leave here every Sunday morning. Uh, I told Doug, you know, Doug used to always get up here and make everybody smile. And I said that last, the last service, and it just nothing changed. And I said, I don't know if y'all watch Andrew Griffith, but there's one old Floyd the barber says, they're not rejoicing. Y'all remember that? That's the way I felt last time when I said that. It, everybody just changed. They're not rejoicing. But we're going to rejoice. We're going to rejoice. We ought to rejoice every time we're in here. We got a few announcements. We didn't have anything from the youth and nothing from the children, did we? <coughs> we do have a baby shower coming up, Katie's baby shower, November the 1st, and it's going to be a drive through You just drive through under the thing out there, pick your presents out, and, <laughs> and, uh, and go on. It'll be, a, it'll be a quick one. It's from 2 o'clock to 2.05. And... <laughs> I'm about, I'm not, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. It's, a, it's two to three, two to three on that Sunday afternoon. Uh, is there any other announcements that we have? Sa that's right, Sandy had one for the teenagers next Saturday night. They're going to have their uh, 5.30 in the Family Life Center, their meeting where they're going to have to sing, Crimson Flow is going to sing some, they're going to have finger food. It's uh, next, next Saturday night at 5.30 at the Family Life Center. That's for the teenagers. Is there any other announcements? Anybody have an announcement? Well, so if y'all don't know, he's going to start booking his tour dates to go out and do his comedy act. So people are coming up soon, all right? Isn't it good to be able to laugh in the house of the Lord? Amen. You know, we go through a rough week, and we can come into the house of the Lord and just rejoice and be glad. Uh, we appreciate everybody being here today. If you're a visitor, a uh, guest with us this morning, we appreciate you coming and being a part of our service. If it's your first time following us here on the live stream, we appreciate you being a part of it also. Uh, scripture the Lord gave me this morning comes out of Acts chapter 3. It's when Peter and John were going uh, to prayer, and they came upon the, uh, the lame man. And Peter looks at him. In verse 6, he says, Then Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have. But what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise, rise and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. Here's what we're here to give you today, Jesus. We're here today for one reason and one reason only, and that's Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. We're not here to do anything but to worship and to honor him and to offer him to you so as you accept him into your life, he can make a miraculous change. And we're going to offer you Christ, and we're going to be here with a hammer to help you up. Amen? That's what church is about. We're here today for Him and Him only. So today, as you are getting into the worship service and praising and worshiping the Lord, remember that we're here for Jesus. He died, was buried, and rose again so that we can have our sins washed away and our lives made right with Him. Amen? Let's worship the Lord today. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Over every heart and every mind Cause I know there's peace within your presence I'll speak Jesus I just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark starts to break Bearing there is hope and there is freedom I'll speak Jesus Your name is power Your name is 
great God we serve today. We're going to start out with a song. We sang it this morning. We haven't sang it in a while. But we have a God that is greater. He is stronger. Yes, He is. And He is higher than any other God. Yes, He is.
thank you for Jesus. We thank you, God. He came, he lived. Father God, he died, was buried, and rose again. And we thank you, Father God, for what his name represents. Lord, I thank you today that at the name of Jesus, Father God, sickness and disease are defeated. I thank you this morning at the name of Jesus, depression is broken. I thank you at the name of Jesus, fear and doubt is defeated. At the name of Jesus, addiction, chains of addiction are broken. Father God, I thank you that in the name of Jesus, marriages are healed and restored. Father, I thank you that your name, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. Lord, I praise you this morning that, Lord, no matter what we've come in here with, that we can cry out to the name of Jesus and we can leave here whole and restored as you come in and you heal our lives. Lord, I thank you for all of it. Save us, set us free, heal us, and make us whole, Father God. And let us be exactly who you've created us to be. Lord, we thank you for all of it. We worship you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
the goodness of God. Cause all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I morning we're gonna kind of look at a area that affects a lot of people and it affects everybody in a unique way um, we're gonna we're starting a, a 
those things in there. If I'm a, if I'm a little sluggish today, how many of y'all had sinus problems? Anybody besides me? That's what I thought. The last service we had about 75% had a sinus problem. That sinus medicine kind of slowed me down a little bit. The Lord picked me back up, but that's the, that's the sluggishness that you see there today, that sinus medicine. Somebody said, I thought you believe in the Lord healing. I do, but I don't tell him how to do it because as it is medicine, so be it. <laughs> uh, praise the Lord. But in, uh, on Wednesday night, last Wednesday night, we started a, a, a two-week study. It could be like three, I don't know, but a two-week study on uh, demons. And uh, demons is not a topic that's talked about a lot in the Baptist churches, but uh, they, they don't deny them. They just don't talk about them a lot. But we, I feel like, and the Lord's impressed on me, the more we know about them, the more we know what we fight. Always, the more you know about the enemy, the better you can fight him. And we have to do our fighting through the Lord because it says we don't wrestle with flesh and blood. Our battle's in the spiritual realm. And what we're dealing with this morning is definitely in the spiritual realm. I'm going to start in 1 Corinthians. I'm going to wind up going back into some scripture that we hit before, a year or so ago. We were in it. But uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning with verse 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning with verse 12. It says, All things are lawful for me. But all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Food's for the stomach, and the stomach for food. But God will destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot certainly not or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her for the two he says shall become one but he who is joined in the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body. But he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have from God, and you are not your own. Sexual immorality is the only sin I see in the scriptures that says it's a sin against your own body. I believe, and I believe the Lord's shown me, that everybody, as we deal with gossip, everybody, whether they admit it or not, has to deal with gossip, the temptation to gossip, temptation to say things we shouldn't say. Everybody has some type, some time in their life, been dealing with temptation of sexual immorality. Why? Because the devil knows our weakness. God made us. He made us in a certain way, and he made things such as the such as sex for marriage. And it's very plain in the Bible that it is for marriage, but it has other things can be totally abused. I saw some things I did not know, even though I know a little bit of science as far as uh, learning it in, I guess you could say, worldly situations. Uh, I know I've got about 37 hours of, of science, college hours, but there, I did not realize that was something I saw here in studying this. Uh, that there, when, when porn is viewed, several things happen to the brain involving powerful hormones, two of which are 
oxytocin and vasopressin. Some of you probably heard those. And oxytocin and vasopressin, uh, they're called the love hormones. Oxytocin is released when we hug or kiss a loved one. It regulates social interaction and sexual reproduction, playing a role in empathy, generosity, orgasm, and human bonding. Vasopressin is a hormone found in most mammals, which is also used as a medication that numbs the pain. As this teaching shows, uh, oxytocin and vasopressin, when they when they are released, they uh, this was amazing to me. It, it's an intoxicating combination. It in, intended to bring loved ones closer together and promote mental healing. It, or instead, in a sinful way, they're operating out of a sinful activity which completely confuses the brain. Now, this is scientifically, it's actually supporting totally what the Bible says. But I did not know either that when you have a sexual experience, your brains make these opates, which are four times stronger than morphine. Four times stronger than morphine. Boom. Hits your brain. Your brain lights up like a Christmas tree. This is the highest chemical reward your brain gets for anything. That's why... A lot of guys get in trouble even in the ministry. They don't know their brain is defective. So we see that science actually backs up what the scriptures say. Uh, there's a big problem nowadays with porn. And the Internet has made this a lot worse. At one time, you know, it had to be in magazines or something. But now it's just people getting on the Internet. And even down in kids getting on the Internet and getting into things with this porn, and it has a very negative effect. It also, the teaching, teaching also went into the fact that uh, there is a part of the brain that is responsible for convicting you of wrongdoing. And this, in these situations, it starts to uh, have the effect on that part of the brain that numbs it. It's kind of like your, your uh, when you become hard and can't hear the Holy Spirit. The more that something happens, the harder a person gets, and they don't they don't hear the Holy Spirit. So this, this actually everything I saw in this study backed up what the Bible says about it. So there's the scripture that says um, that was verse 18. He who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body, and we become very hardened if we if this is let go. Now I'm going to get into that. Uh, the the positive a positive part of that in just a minute, but when we see these things happening, we see the problem with porn. We see some areas nowadays where they're trying to change what the scriptures say, and this is one of the areas where it's trying to be changed. They try to say it's outdated, uh, and and I want to say again, the Bible will never be outdated, never. I'm going to go back to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. I'm going to look at what and why some things happen. What and why. Uh, in Romans chapter 1, I'm going to begin reading with verse 18. See what happened to the, these, uh, the Gentiles here as the, Lord was, as the Lord was speaking of that here through Paul. Verse 18, for the wrath of of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Now, first of all, the things that are being taught nowadays that there is the wrath of God is no longer here, that's a total lie. There is one of the New Testament scriptures that prove that's a total lie. The wrath of God, it says, is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. Putting a lie out there instead of the truth. Now, here we live in a day and time when there is, there's always been lies. I mean, there's, but we, there's so much lying going on now you don't know who to believe. 
and people are confused, people are mixed up. That's why we need to go to the Bible and know what's in these scriptures. Know what the Bible says about it. Then in verse 19 he says, Because what may be known of God is manifested in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. There is no excuse not to know that there is a God. There's no excuse not to know that this, this, this being, this extraterrestrial being, there is a God that is all-powerful. We see that. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Now this is very important that we get a hold of what this one verse says here. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God. I mentioned a while ago the demons that we started studying. If you don't know what, the de what demons are, they're, this is, they're scriptural beings. When Satan was kicked out of heaven, part of the angels, and I think it says one-third of them, were kicked out with him. They're his army down here. They are actually active in doing the things, doing Satan's duty, the things Satan wants them to do. They're active, and they will tempt you. They can even possess people. Now, we don't see a lot of demon possession, but we do see demon oppression. I'm not sure even that some of these folks that have gone off on these tirades as far as uh, burning these cities down and things, I'm not sure that there's not some of them that are demon-possessed. The behavior sure could point that way, but we know that if it's not possessed, they're at least oppressed by the demonic behavior or the demons themselves. So because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God. Now, here's why. Here's, here's where he's starting. He's going, why did this happen to them right here? He said, because they knew God, they didn't glorify him as God. They were not thankful, it says. They were not worshiping him, glorifying him, praising him. They were not doing this to show that their actions showed that they knew him. We're supposed to worship Him. We're supposed to praise Him. We're supposed to honor Him. We're supposed to thank Him. We are made for Him. He's not made for us. So because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God. Nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Their thoughts became futile. They did not bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Remember what what Ephesians, I believe it is, says, bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Every thought that comes into your head ought to be brought to Jesus right then. Every sin that you commit, and if you commit a sexual sin, you first think about committing that. It didn't just boom happen. You think about it. But if you bring that thought captive to the obedience of Christ, then there's a good chance you will not commit that sin. How do you do that? Well, there, you know, one thing around here we've started doing a lot of, and I guarantee you some of these men in that Tuesday morning Bible study will tell you that this works. When you get that thought that you know is not God, you get that thought. It could be sexual. It could be anything else. It could be gossip or something like that. But that thought comes into your mind. You bring it captive to the obedience of Christ. You know it's not right. You know it's not God. You say, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Now, that's as simple as it gets. Jesus, 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 that, that right there actually works. It brings, demons cannot stand in the presence of Jesus, nor, nor can they stand in the praise of Jesus. When you start praising the Lord, they have to flee. They can't stand in that. So bring in that, Jesus, 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 bring the thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. For they were professing to be wise. And they became fools. Changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man. Birds, four-footed animals, creeping things. That's what he puts here, meaning that things were put to worship instead of God. They were putting things in front of God. 
There were things to worship instead of God. And anything that we worship instead of God is a God itself. We have made God out of that. It doesn't matter what it is. If we, uh, it, you know, you have a choice. You have a choice whether to be here right now or to be somewhere else. You make a choice. Now, there's people that will tell you all kind of things to comfort you. They will tell you all kind of things because they ain't where they're supposed to be. But you will choose whether to be here on Sunday morning or not. Whichever one is more important to you is where you will be. That's where you will be. Now, is there times that you can't be? Yes. There may be times you're having to take care of a child. There may be times you're having to do something that, it, that God has you doing. But most of the time, it's what we choose which one's the most important. What we choose. So you see, they were choosing things other than God. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. Why did God do that? Why did he give them up to uncleanness? Why did he do that? Because they didn't recognize him as God. Because they didn't honor him as God. Then things begin to happen. It starts slowly. It doesn't just jump on you. You start having the thoughts, and you don't deal with the thoughts, and it starts little by little, and one day you, you will wake up and you'll say, how did I get here? And it won't be pleasant because you got there by not cutting it off to start with, bringing the thought captive to obedience to Christ. So these, the Gentiles here, God says, he, it says God gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts. Their hearts were going after ungodly things. Now listen to what he says here in verse 25. Who exchanged the truth of God for a lie. <laughs> exchanged the truth of God for a lie. So much of that is done. We will listen so many times to somebody that says what we want to hear instead of somebody that cares enough about us to tell us what we're supposed to hear, what we need to hear. Who exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason... God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use of what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. I don't know how much plainer he can get than that right there. Women with women is wrong in the eyes of God. Men with men is wrong in the eyes of God. It's a sin. It's a sin. Is that the only sin there is? No, it's not the only sin there is, but it is a sin. Homosexuality is wrong in the eyes of God. It is trying to be changed. They're trying to say that that is outdated, that that is no longer the way society is. Well, that's probably right it's no longer the way society is but it's still the way the bible is the bible will never change what it says in here today is what it means today it meant that yesterday and it will mean that tomorrow so they gave up gave them up to vile passions likewise men living leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust for one another committing what is shameful and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, here we go again. They didn't like to retain God in their knowledge. What the things of God, what God says, what, what is it in the word of God? They didn't like to retain God in their knowledge. They wanted some, somebody else to tell them something different. They wanted to change the word of God. And as, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge God gave them over to a debased mind a bad mind an evil thinking mind to do those things which are not fitting being filled with all unrighteousness it didn't stop right there it didn't mean that they were only committing homosexuality but homosexuality became a big part of what they were doing and it was wrong in the eyes of God 
being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, which could be adultery, which could be fornication. All these things are wrong in the eyes of God, and no matter whether anybody wants to admit it or not, but I don't believe there's a person sitting in this sanctuary this morning that hadn't dealt with some type of thought somewhere in their life of sexual immorality because the demons know where to go. They know where to hit you. They know how your body is made. So they're going to, that's going to happen, and we've got to deal with it when it comes. We've ignored some of that stuff in church because we've got so religious sometimes. We don't want to get down here where we live. The only way we can deal with that is to have a right relationship with Jesus, be filled with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will strengthen us where we're weak. Read that scripture you read a while ago. The Lord gave Lisa this in the middle of that last sermon. For my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. The Holy Spirit. Where we're weak, He's strong. And His strength is, is sufficient for our weakness. So when we're walking with the Lord, He will strengthen us when we have a desire for Him, when we're seeking Him, when we're glorifying Him, when we're worshiping Him, when we're praising Him, when we're putting Him first, His strength is sufficient in our weakness. He goes on with not just sexual immorality. He goes on there into wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy. They were murderers. They stirred up strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They were whisperers, gossipers, backbiters, haters of God. They hated God because God was the truth, and they were wanting a lie. They were violent, proud, Boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. And I want to say this. I said it in the last meeting too. We do not have, we can say these kids today, they're just disrespectful. We can say these teenagers today, they're just disrespectful. They just do this. Let me tell you something. We don't have a children problem. We got a parenting problem. We have a parenting problem. They don't, children don't just grow up to be rebellious if they're parented right. Parenting is where the problem is. We have a whole generation that came through without proper type of parenting. They were getting more, they're at school longer than they're with a parent, and they were getting things there that did not go along with what the Bible says, and we get a whole generation out there now that is living what they were taught. And we're seeing it all over the United States of America. We need godly parenting. We need a parent. I, I deal with parents. I hope we don't have that in this church. I really do. But I deal with parents that are scared of their teenagers. They are scared of their teenagers. You talk about, well, when we were growing up, if I got in trouble at school, I got in trouble at home. Well, it's not that way with everybody anymore because they're scared of the teenagers. They will make a decision to back a child instead of the teacher because they feel like if they do that, that child will have them on their side, and it don't work that way. I deal with it all the time. I see it. We just need that parent that can say no and love that child like we're supposed to. So we don't have a child that's a parenting deal, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Approve of those who practice them. We see in that too. The, the, hom the homosexual move. You know, we have people that may not be homosexual, but they approve, they approve of that. Let me tell you something. Homosexuality will not separate you from God any more than gossip will. Gossip will separate you from God, just like homosexuality. Adultery will separate you from God, just like homosexuality. Fornication will separate you from God, just like homosexuality. Disobedience to parents will separate you, just like homosexuality. Sin will separate you from God. 
But the key, the thing, is not to justify. Don't justify. Sin is sin. You can love that person. Don't judge the person's heart. We would have been wrong to have judged David's heart when he committed adultery and then committed murder because God said, he's a man after my own heart. But we could judge the sin. The sin was wrong. He had consequences for that sin. We see that in the scriptures. But we should not judge the heart. So what, are we, what am I saying? I'm saying you still, the old saying goes, and it's good. It's not just a cliche. Hate the sin, but love the sinner. You judge that sin, but you still love the sinner. Because that sin is no worse. It's no worse than the adultery. Now, why? I don't know, but the Bible does say that homosexuality is an abomination to the Lord. And we know that sexual sins bring on things. The Bible said it's a sin against your own body. You sin against your own body? Well, think about syphilis. Think about gonorrhea. Think about AIDS. Think about the things that destroy the body that's brought on from sexual sin. Things that we don't like to talk about. We don't like to tell about. We need to tell the truth. You go against God's way, against God's natural way, it will bring on consequences that will tear your body apart. Sexual sin is a sin against your own body body when you're preaching the word of God and teaching the word of God it should never any sermon should never end with darkness because we serve a God of light we serve a God, serve a God of love we serve a God that was loved us so much that he sent his own son to die just so we'd have a way and I want to go to Romans 8 1 Right here, I'm going to read 1 and 2. Romans chapter 8, verse 1 and 2. We present Jesus. We present the real Jesus, the Jesus of these scriptures, the Jesus that's given us this word. And we see in Romans 8, 1, there, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. The law, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. In Christ Jesus, those that have accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, those that have come to the Lord, it does not matter if they were a homosexual. It doesn't matter if they've committed adultery. It doesn't matter if they've been married before and they're divorced. If it's forgiven, it's forgiven. And in the eyes of God, he says, if I have forgiven you, it's gone. I don't remember it anymore. It's as far away as the east is from the west. It ain't coming back unless those demons bring them back. Those demons will come back and they will tell you things that are a total lie. And when you have confessed to the Lord and been forgiven of those sins, when they're brought back up, and I don't care who brings it back up, if it's just a thought or if you got some knucklehead bringing it back up, if that's the case, it's a lie out of the pits of hell. Don't believe it because God said it's gone as far away as the east is from the west. And if he says he don't remember it, he don't remember it. But the demons do remember it. The demons remember it and they will bring it back up. They will remind you of it. And they will, if, if they can't get the thought to get through, they'll send somebody to you to remind you of it. But we have a God that gives us a means to fight the battle. And actually, this, this Wednesday night, it, we're going into the defense we have. We, we, last Wednesday night, we looked at what is a demon, where they came from, and what they can do. This Wednesday night, we're going into our defense of these. And we do. We have power over them in the name of Jesus. Remember, he said, when I go, I will send you back the Holy Spirit. And that's why uh, it's so important to be filled, baptized, saturated with the Holy Spirit. When we are saturated with the Holy Spirit, we have the power within us. And in the name of Jesus, we fight the battle and win the battle. That is our authority in Jesus Christ. There is a way. That we win. 
We've already got it one. And we need to be sure that we spread the word of God. You know, as far away as the east is from the west, that's a pretty long way, isn't it? I, I mean, I can't even, I can't, I can't get that. But that's what God says. So the things that I've committed in the past, you know, I've told you before that that guy came up to me when I preached down there in the prison out St. Clair one night, this big white guy, and he, he said, I can't believe God can forgive me because I killed two people. Well, he can. And he has paid the price for that. And, there, you know, there's sometimes that we do not want somebody else to get forgiveness. There's sometimes that we don't want, and I've dealt with this. I've dealt with it this year, as a matter of fact. You get one parent that wants this child to be uh, put away for life, but when the, all of a sudden the shoe's on the other foot and it's their child that's guilty, all of a sudden they want forgiveness. You know, this world, we need, and we need to remember that. We need to remember that none of us are immune. And we could be going through something we didn't think we'd be going through. We could be going through that tomorrow or next week. We better remember and we better have mercy because the Word of God says mercy will come to those who show mercy. That's Scripture. Mercy will come to those who show mercy. I want the mercy of my God. I'm going to show mercy. I want the mercy of my God. And His Word says... I'll show mercy to those that show mercy. And there's things that I need mercy for. I wouldn't be standing here today if it wasn't for the mercy of God. And you know, I just don't believe I'm the only one in here that's in that category. I believe there's others that need the mercy of God. And we're here today because of that mercy. And we need to remember that we never, ever justify sin. But we also are willing to to forgive the sinner. We're never ever going to say homosexuality is okay today because society's changed because that's not right, not in the eyes of God. But we can say to the homosexual, I love you. I, I, I love you and I care about where you are and what happens to you. And I even love the old gospel. I'm going to tell you something. You know I deal with a whole lot of people and I'd rather deal to me, there's a spirit there that's very tough to deal with in the homosexual spirit. But I'd rather deal with that one than I had the gossip. The person that's the gossip never wants to admit it. Many of them don't. That gossip can kill as many people as the diseases that are brought on by homosexuality or anything else. So remember, Jesus Christ died for everybody's sins. Everybody. Not one's left out. He said, the sins of the world. That's the God that we serve. And I'm going to ask you today, are you totally honest with him about where you stand? Because the wrath of God is still the wrath of God. And if we keep going in a direction that we shouldn't be going, our hearts will start to harden. And it becomes a whole lot harder for that heart, heart to soften and for him to get through when it begins to harden. As we have the invitation today, if the Lord puts somebody on your heart, He may put a homosexual on your heart. He may put somebody that's having an affair on your heart. He may put somebody that is in fornication on your heart. He may put somebody that's gossiping on your heart. If He puts somebody on your heart to pray for, pray for, pray for, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And right now, if you want me to pray for you, if you need healing, whatever you need, I want to do that. The altar is open for anybody that wants to come. Would you stand right now as we have the words of invitation? Lord, prepare me Praise you, Lord. to be a sanctuary, pure.
So pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living I'm going to ask you to take a seat for just a moment, and we're going to baptize her this morning here in just a minute. Lisa will sing something else right here, and we'll be ready in just a second here to baptize her. All right. If y'all put, are you washed in the blood up there? Hey, y'all can stay and sing with me. Yeah. That's right. We got to have us all. We got to have us all singing this morning. Been to Jesus for the cleansing power. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace? Is our are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Oh, are you washed in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Yes, are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the land? Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the land? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the land? Oh, are you washed in the blood? In the soul cleansing blood of the land, are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the land? When the bridegroom cometh, will your robes be white? Are you washed in the blood of the land? Oh, will your soul be ready for the mansions bright and be washed in the blood of the land? Oh, are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay 
inside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Oh, there's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Oh, I'm going to wear a crown. I'm going to wear a crown. Oh, when that trumpet sounds. Yes, when that trumpet sounds. I'm going to wear a crown. I'm going to wear a crown. We shall wear a robe and crown. Oh. Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. 